Hi guys, well, this is True Soda and we are live on a Tuesday this time, which is a bit unusual. And I'm so sorry that we've been a bit delayed in starting, we've had a few technical hitches, but we are live now and hopefully you should be able to hear and see us loud and clear. And with us today, we are very pleased to welcome Dr. David Healy, who is a psychiatrist, psychopharmacologist, and a scientist who has been described as the doctor that Big Pharma can't shut up. Um, he has written 20 books, including the antidepressant era, Let Them Eat Prozac, and most recently, Pharmageddon, which argues that the pharmaceutical industry has uh, hijacked healthcare in the United States. Um, and on top of all of that, Dr. Healy is also a professor of psychiatry at Bangor University in Wales, and he's also the founder of the website risk.org, which is actually spelt rxisk.org, if you'd like to check it out. Um, and this is a website that allows patients to report um, any side effects they've experienced after taking prescription drugs. Um, so we will be talking to him today um, about the pharmaceutical industry and how all of it, or at least parts of it, um, work to manipulate data um, and to just find out more about the inner workings of the industry, really. Um, so we're very excited to have him on. Um, and as always, I've got the laptop here, so if you've got questions that you'd like us to pass on to Dr. Healy, uh, just keep those coming through and we'll try and get in as many as we can. So, without further delay, um, if we can move on to our first question, Dr. Healy, that'd be great. Um, it would be great to find out more about how data is being manipulated uh, by the pharmaceutical industry to provide uh, or to produce positive results. Laura, hi, it's good to be here. The industry do a bunch of things to hide the, uh, all of uh, the problems that can happen on drugs. The first thing they do is they run clinical trials as opposed to giving the drug to you or me, for instance, and looking at what the drug does to us. Uh, and if it, say, maybe causes a problem uh, which clears up when the drug is halted and reappears when you go on the drug again, and this is cl clear evidence that the drug has caused uh, uh, the problem, it's what's called the Christmas tree light bulb test, which is back in the old days when Christmas trees used to have the old style kind of light bulbs, and you put the Christmas tree up in the attic at, uh, after Christmas, take it out again, put the lights on the tree, and as sure as eggs were eggs, the Christmas tree lights didn't work. And you unscrewed the bulbs in turn until you unscrewed one and found that the lights came on again. You screwed it in again and the lights went off, and you knew that was the faulty bulb, so you threw it away. That's the Christmas tree light bulb test. In the same way, if you're trying to find out does a drug cause a problem, the best way is just give it to people and have a look at what happens, and if the problem appears and then clears up once you halt the drug and maybe reappears if you go on the drug again. That's conclusive evidence in just one person that this drug can cause a problem. But what the companies do is they run clinical trials where they give the drug to hundreds of people and if the problem only appears in a few people and it's not statistically significant, then the companies claim that it's really not actually happening. It's just not there. That you know, the clinical trial, which is, they say, more reliable than the observations of an individual patient or an individual doctor, has proven that this just isn't happening. That's what happens repeatedly with the different uh, drugs that have been on the market since we brought clinical trials in as a way to bring drugs uh, on the market. Now, the next thing they do is when you put 100 people, say, on a drug through a clinical trial, and say it's an uh, one of the SSRI antidepressants like Prozac, Siroxat, Zoloft, whatever, what they'll do then is you could become more anxious on this drug or agitated or nervous or you find it hard to get to sleep. They'll somehow manage to code these things. Well, there'll be a few people who'll be coded as being anxious, a few people coded as being agitated, a few people coded as being hyperactive, a few people coded as finding it hard to actually go to sleep, and a few people coded as becoming suicidal. If you were to add them all uh, together, you'd see that there was a big problem, okay? But if you break them out into different groups, then it seems like each group is reasonably small. You know, they're able, uh, uh, the company's able to put its hand on its heart and say, look, there was only three people out of 100 that became anxious. But if you got to see all of the data, you'd realize, actually, there's a much bigger problem here. And in fact, on this group of drugs, 20 people out of 100 become so anxious that they have to drop out of the trials often. 
But, and here's a key thing, the companies run these trials <clears throat> and they get to hide the data. No one like me, or you, or anyone can go in and check and see what actually happened. The data all goes into the company vaults. Now, if I was trying to bring a treatment uh, on the market and made some claim that I have a drug that's a wonderful treatment for your nerves or for your weight problem or for, uh, well, for a whole range of things, okay, and refuse to let you uh, on ITN, for instance, see the data behind the claim that I was making, that would be the end of me as a serious, um, as a serious clinical researcher. But we let the pharmaceutical industry get away with this the whole time. They make endless claims and no one's able to get to see the data. If you ask them for the data, they say, get lost. And then there's a further thing, which is this. When they, when they get the, the clinical trial data, one of the things is to write this material up in the form uh, of uh, a research paper that's going to appear in maybe the Lancet or the BMJ or the New England Journal of Medicine. The bigger the name journal, the bigger uh, the sales that will usually come from this article. And these articles appear with a whole string of authors' names on them. There could be the Professor of Medicine from Oxford, <clears throat> or Cambridge, or Harvard, or Yale, or whatever. A big, long string of names. Increasingly, and, and in fact, in almost all cases, when it comes to an industry trial, even though you have these very distinguished names on uh, the authorship line, and the article appears in the best journal in uh, the field, these people haven't been the authors and haven't seen the data. The article's been ghost-written. Virtually every article about an unpatent drug these days is ghost-written for the company that's been uh, the sponsor of the clinical trial that has just been done. And ghostwriters don't usually tell lies, but they're very creative. Let's say nine people out of a hundred have become suicidal on the antidepressant in this trial, what the ghostwriter will do is say, we're just reporting the side effects that occurred at a 10% rate or more. So they haven't actually told a lie. They haven't said anything wrong, but they have concealed a very serious problem, which most people, like me or you, for instance, if we were going to try and tell people what actually happened in this clinical trial, you would say to them that, 9% of the people that were put in this pill became suicidal. But that manages just to vanish. So, uh, do, you, do you think then, I mean, I've never heard that before about this ghostwriting business. Um, so do you think a, a lot of the responsibility for this lies not just with the pharmaceutical industry then, but also with um, the scientists and medical professionals at, that are putting their names to these articles? Absolutely, yes. I think this is the thing that's crept up on us reasonably slowly over the last 10 to 15 years uh, or more. It began during the 80s. Uh, um, uh, uh, it, hang on, it began during uh, the 1980s and crept up on us reasonably slowly. And I think when most people got uh, involved in this first, when people like me or whatever were had articles written for them by uh, at the pharmaceutical industry, we assumed that the ghostwriters who were helping out with this thing, that they at least had seen uh, uh, the actual data, or at least one or two of the authors on uh, the authorship line had actually gotten uh, to see the data, and that what was being written was a good representation of the data, of the things that actually happened in the trial. It's clear now, it's been clear for at least the last 10 to 15 years that this isn't actually the case. And probably the thing that made it most clear was when the companies ran clinical trials of antidepressants in children. This was probably the, the, the defining moment. Uh, and as of 2004, when it became clear there was a fuss uh, about the antidepressants causing children to become suicidal, when that fuss happened and the companies were forced to reveal the 
data that they had on uh, the clinical trials that had been done, it became clear that every single trial that had been done had been written either by a ghostwriter or within uh, uh, the company. And in every single instance, the claims that were being made for the drug in terms of how well it worked and how safe it was were actually misleading, seriously misleading, that these drugs just didn't work and weren't actually safe. So as of then, the field has really been on notice that this kind of thing is happening. And you can't assume anymore that uh, the ghostwriters and that uh, uh, the company are playing fair. But it's still hard to know how many of the senior academics in the field have taken that on board. Partly because, you know, well, it means that uh, you know, the hard work of having uh, uh, actually uh, to write the article gets done for them. And when they uh, so-called author these articles that appear in really good journals, of course, they get asked to come and talk at wonderful meetings that are happening in Japan or California or Australia or whatever. And this is nice to be able to be flown in as the international expert and things like this on these issues to talk about an article where actually you didn't do the work and probably haven't seen uh, uh, the data either. But there's a lot of kudos for uh, the academic people that are uh, involved, a lot of incentives that have helped them to play the game. Seem to me anyway um, very misleading for the public because I, you know, if they read an article in a respected journal like The Lancet and when you hear the media reporting on these <laughs> articles in these journals, which they do frequently, um, I think they assume that this is coming from a respected academic. So, but if people really knew that it was coming from a, a pharmaceutical industry that was trying to sell these drugs, I think, yeah. you know, they'd probably be pretty shocked. Absolutely. And the way I've tried to convey this to people is this, that a media person, are, I mean, one of the things that you have to bear in mind is that journals like uh, the BMJ and the New England Journal of Medicine are, in essence, just newspapers that are, they're part of the media, and the people who run these journals are media people also. But unlike you, for instance, where you have to check that the sources for the story that you're going to run are actually there. I mean, if you run uh, an actual story and the data behind the story uh, aren't true, or the claims that are being made don't hold up, the legal people behind this program for instance, will be all over you and, 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 and will be awfully concerned. Well, in actual fact, what I've been s saying to people for years now is that if the if we ran our uh, if we ran the articles about how well these drugs work uh, in a newspaper like The Guardian or The Times or The New York Times, we would all be a lot safer than having them appear in journals like The Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine because journalists like you and journalists like this program are much more concerned to actually establish the truth of the claims being made than the journalists that run the BMJ or The Lancet or the New England Journal of Medicine. And that's a fairly shocking claim to make, but it is the kind of thing that should try and bring things home to people, that really the academic journals that we have aren't doing the job that they ought to be doing. They take these articles, they know they're ghostwritten, they now know that uh, often the articles are fraudulent, that there have been companies that have been sued for fraud based on the mismatch between the article that's appeared and the data from the actual trial. But even despite this, the academic journals and the academic journalists don't uh, feel that it's their duty to try and make sure that uh, the claims that are being made for this drug actually stand up. And if you think about it, this is awfully serious, because if these claims don't stand up, you and I are then going to take a treatment that, we, that possibly isn't going to work for us. We're going to take it in good faith, and we're going to give it to our children for instance, mm -hmm. and we're not told what the true risks are that we may actually be taking with this pill. Mm -hmm. 
So obviously there, as, as you're beginning to show to us, there are, are more players that sort of involved in this than just the pharmaceutical companies. Um, but I was wondering about another player, the government, and why you think that they, they you know, haven't created laws that would make it illegal for drug companies to hide um, data and to not release all trial results. Yeah, that's an extraordinarily good question, and I think part of the problem here is that, you see, there isn't anyone who wins when drugs go wrong. Uh, um, uh, the government want there to be good news about drugs. Um, people like David Cameron want you to think that all of the drugs we have are working wonderfully well. The companies we have here in the UK and elsewhere, they also want good news about pills. Doctors want good news about pills as well, and of course, you and I, when we get sick, want to believe that we've been put in a thing that's going to work, and we don't really want to hear that there could be risks or harms. So there's almost no one in uh, the actual system who, who has an interest in anything but good news about the whole thing. The people who I think are probably failing us the most are not so much at the government, uh, because you know you really can't expect David Cameron to know all about clinical care and medical practice and things like that. He has a whole load of other things to keep his eye on, you know. But it's doctors like me, for instance, who really have probably let people like you down. And the worry, I think, for doctors is this. If we've been so bad at recognizing or doing the job we're actually supposed to do, which is this, we're supposed to be the people that force the pharmaceutical companies to hand over the data about the clinical trials they've done, or to come clean about the risks. The reason these drugs are available on prescription only, that is, you can only get them through me, is the understanding was that a person like me was going to be the kind of person who would force the companies to hand over the data on their pills, and if they didn't hand it over, we just wouldn't use it. The problem if we don't, if doctors don't recognize that it's important to get the bad news about pills out and to tell people what the true risks are, the worry is in the kind of healthcare world that we're moving into where increasingly nurses can prescribe, clinical psychologists can prescribe, pharmacists can also prescribe, that the people who run healthcare these days are going to look at doctors and say, well, these guys are very expensive. We can get cheaper people, like nurses and others, to prescribe treatments also. Uh, and, you know, do we really need doctors? What else do they offer us? So my hunch is ultimately, sometime, doctors are going to have to step up to the plate. They're going to have to man up and be the people who really are the ones who say, well, you know, these pills aren't all they're cracked up to be, and they do come with risks and it takes an expert to recognize what the risks are and if need be an expert to or an expert will be the person who will often get you off treatments rather than the person that puts you on the treatments. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you think then there's a lot of doctors that are prescribing drugs that they really don't know much about or don't know enough about the possible side effects? Um, I think that's part of the truth. The other half of it is this, and this might be slightly more complex. I think we, because of clinical trials, we've got a culture where doctors have almost been trained not to believe the evidence of their own eyes uh, mm -hmm. these days. So that when a person goes in a pill and turns blue and grows feathers, if the clinical trials don't show that the drug can do this, the doctor doesn't believe that the drug has caused, either doesn't see you turn blue on this pill, or if you claim that only since you've been put on the pill, they just they still don't believe that the pill could have caused it. They don't believe the evidence of their own eyes anymore. And also, <clears throat> it's awfully hard for patients to speak up because when you go into uh, uh, the when you go into uh, the doctor that has put you on these pills in good faith, I mean he's trying to help you say, when you go in and say, doctor, you know, this didn't work out all that well and things seem to be going wrong, it feels like you're going to make him unhappy. And if you are feeling bad, if things have begun to go wrong on a pill, 
the last thing you want to do is to make the doctor who looks like your way out of the problem un, uh, to make him unhappy. So you often don't let him know the things have gone wrong. But just to go back a bit, what I was actually trying to outline earlier is partly because of clinical trials, we've had a huge change of culture as regards pills. We used to, 20, 30, 40 years ago, we used to view medicines as poisons to be used with care. And the art of medicine lay in making sure that you didn't take risks that you didn't need to take and, in, and also ensuring that you got the right dose of uh, uh, the poison so that you didn't do more harm than you had to do. But because clinical trials focuses away from the safety aspects of pills and they just answer uh, the question, does this pill work? We've transformed medicines from poisons into fertilizers. And fertilizers are things that most people feel, well, we should use as much as we can. If we sprinkle these things reasonably widely, more things will grow generally. And that's the culture change we've got, which is where doctors 40 or 50 years ago were much slower to use pills, wouldn't want you on more than one pill at one time, and didn't keep you on pills for longer than you ought to be on them. Now doctors will happily have you on three or four or five pills all at the same time, and they don't keep you on pills for short periods of time, but they often keep you on pills for months or years. And older people in particular are at huge risk for this because, you know, it's now over the age of 50, it's increasingly common for people to be on at least five pills and to be on them permanently. So that's the kind of culture change we've got. So it's not one of just doctors not knowing enough about the pills. It's, you know, it's more a case of both doctors and you and I could learn more about these pills if every time you or I took a pill, both the doctor that put us on the pills and you and I looked closely at what was actually happening, we don't do that these days because there's no premium. The companies have been very successful at trying to persuade us, both the doctor and you and I, that the evidence of our own eyes just doesn't count. The clinical trial evidence, where they withhold the data and go strike the articles, that's the evidence that counts. Somehow we've got to try and reverse this culture and get people back believing the evidence of their own eyes once again. Mm -hmm. And presumably, um, if if people are taking more and more pills, then the pharmaceutical industry is is making bigger and bigger profits. Absolutely, right? yeah, yeah. We're in a world. We're in a world where um, forty to fifty years ago, both uh, 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 the pharmaceutical companies and doctors did a huge amount to keep us alive. They produced pills that meant that our children didn't die young. They produced pills that meant that we were much less likely to have life-threatening problems. They produced pills that cured a whole load of things, or at least helped control a whole load of illnesses that were killing us prematurely. But the way things have got at the moment is we're now doing more to keep the pharmaceutical companies alive than they are to keep us alive. We've entered a world where actually drug-induced death, treatment-induced death is possibly the leading cause of death in the Western world now. It's certainly in hospitals, it's the third leading cause of death. In actual fact, um, in hospitals, we've got a good chance when people die in hospital to work out what the cause of death is. But much more people die outside of hospital, and they don't die outside of hospital as often from heart attacks and strokes and things like this, which are the leading causes of death. The chances are when you die out of hospital these days, particularly if you're over the age of 50 or so, that the leading cause of death is likely to be one of the treatments you're on. And one of the curious things about this is when people, when doctors record the cause of death, they never record the drug that you've been on as a possible cause of death. So we don't have good data on this either. But the point is, uh, as I say here, we're, th these drugs are not enhancing our life expectancy anymore. If anything, they're tending to reduce it. But in the process, we're keeping the pharmaceutical companies uh, alive. They're less and less producing 
really good treatments for the kinds of things that we need treatments for, like tumors and the various illnesses in the third world and things like that that really need good treatments. They're producing, they're, they're producing drugs that are less effective, cost more, and are generally less safe. And we're paying more and more for these treatments, and the NHS, for instance, is paying more and more for these treatments to the point where it's going to potentially bankrupt the NHS. But out of it, we're getting premature deaths and drug-induced uh, drug induced injuries at a greater rate than we ever used to get them before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you just said a lot of very shocking things there, I think, um, that our viewers would probably be very surprised about. Um, I mean, that's just, just insane that the said biggest cause of death could be caused by the thing, the very things that we think are, are trying to help us and, and keep us alive longer. Um, yeah. Uh, so I was, I was wondering if, with all this in mind, what, what sort of oversight and regulation there is for the pharmaceutical industry, if you could maybe just explain this to our viewers, if there is any at all. Yeah, well, you see, I think this is really a problem that can't be solved by trying to regulate industry. There's, if you put rules in place and get industry to do clinical trials and make drugs available on prescription only. The more rules you put in place, the better industry usually is at being able to get control of things. They, when you have a rule book, industry who have their marketing departments and their legal departments and vast amounts of money uh, you have to spend will usually work out ways to make the rules work for them. One of the key things we need to do is to get back to a world where as I said two or three times, where both doctors and patients recognize that actually we have a role in trying to keep ourselves safe. That it's um, when the, the key thing, uh, the key thing perhaps just uh, to take people back to is the system that we have at the moment is one that was put in place in 1962. It was put in place following the thalidomide crisis. This was a crisis where a sleeping pill was being given uh, uh, to women uh, and when they were pregnant their children were born deformed. Now in response to this crisis we put a bunch of regulations in place that were designed to keep us safe. One of the regulations was that industry were going to be forced to show that their drugs worked. And they're going to be forced to show that their drugs worked through controlled trials, placebo-controlled clinical trials. Uh, the other thing that was going to happen was these drugs were going to be available on prescription only, uh, because the idea was that doctors like me were supposed to be more skeptical about pills than patients like you, for instance. But a few things have happened since. One is this, that even as of 1962, one of the extraordinary things was that there had been only one pill at that time that had been through a placebo-controlled trial before it was brought on the market, okay? And that placebo-controlled trial was done on thalidomide. And in that trial, it had proven to work extraordinarily well and to be completely safe. So the mechanism we put in place to keep all of us safe from that kind of thing happening again was one that the drug that caused the problem had got through absolutely perfectly. You know, it, it hadn't, I mean, if, if it had been brought onto the market after 62, what we would have had was this drug would have got through the regulatory system perfectly. And in fact, the companies then, if, uh, a, uh, if um, any doctor had tried to report that I've had a few women who've been put in this pill and the children have been born deformed. That's the kind of report that led to the drug being pulled off uh, 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 the market. What would have happened after 62 would have been that the company would have been able to say, well, we've got placebo-controlled trials which show that our drug is completely safe. What are you talking about? You're just an individual doctor and your observations don't count compared to the clinical trial data we've got. So this is a, an extraordinary symbol of how we put 
regulations in place that looked terribly good to us, but in actual fact put us at greater risk than the way things were before. The other thing that we put in place was to make the drugs available on prescription only. And the problem then is we hadn't recognized Stockholm Syndrome. That's a, and the reason we hadn't actually, um, the, the, the reason we didn't take that into account was that Stockholm Syndrome didn't happen until 1973. What happened was a guy with a political cause held up a bank in the middle of Stockholm. And he kept the people in the bank hostage there for three, three to four days before the army finally broke in and brought them out. When the people who were in the bank had been held hostage uh, were able to come out also, there was the media were out there waiting for them and they were keen to interview all these people who had been held at gunpoint for three to four days in uh, at the bank. And they asked them, you know, what did you think of this crazed man who was holding you hostage in there? And the media were awfully surprised to find that a lot of the people in the bank said, well, look, we rather liked him. We thought he was an extremely nice man and actually we agreed with his political point of view. That's Stockholm Syndrome. It's a thing that happens when there's a threat to your life, which an illness causes, when you're isolated, which is also what happens when you're ill. You know, the only help you can get it these days is through the doctor. And in particular, if your captor is a nice man, and doctors these days are trained to say to you, have a nice day. A lot of junior doctors, young doctors, you know, when they hear me talk about these things, they say to me, look, this couldn't happen. We're trained to communicate these days, and they think that's going to save them. But in actual fact, the training doctors get to communicate is all about how to break bad news. I'm trained how to tell you the awful truth that you have a cancer or your child maybe maybe uh, may actually be about to die and things like that. But I'm not trained to hear you say to me, doctor, the treatment you put me on has made me worse. I'm just not trained for that at all. So industry know this. And there's a curious thing about pre uh, you know, the fact that these drugs are available on prescription only, which is this, that if, they had to, if the drugs weren't available on prescription only, if they were over the counter, industry would have to market to all of us. They'd have to try and win all of our hearts and minds. But because they're available on prescription only, I am the consumer of the pill. I consume the pill by putting it in your mouth so that when things go wrong, they go wrong for you. So I keep thinking, well, this is a fine pill. You know, nothing goes wrong for me when I consume it, giving it to you. Okay. Industry know this, that I'm the key person who buys their pills. And because of that, they spend roughly 30,000 pounds per doctor per year winning my hearts and my heart and mind and the hearts and minds of all of the other doctors here in the UK and the US and the Western world generally because they don't have to market to the rest of the population. They can concentrate all of the marketing money on just doctors. So they know us better than we know ourselves. So, um, we're going to begin wrapping things up here, but I guess the yeah. next obvious question would be, what, what can be done to improve the situation? It, it almost sounds <laughs> like this. Where, I mean, where to start? Where could you possibly start? Well, I think there's a few things. One is uh, the point that you made earlier. Why doesn't the government force industry to share the data from the clinical trials that have been done? And absolutely, that needs to happen. A second thing that needs to happen is the people who are clinical trial and enthusiasts, and clinical trials can be tremendously helpful. But I think we need to recognize that they're not the answer to all the issues about what a pill does. That there's, there's a mantra around the place these days that clinical trials are the gold standard. They're not. They're, in fact, they're almost the gold standard way to hide the side effects that a drug may cause. And I think we need more recognition of that. The people who are pro 
clinical trials need to be a bit more humble about how useful these trials can be. We desperately need to get back to a world in which both doctors and patients learn again to trust their own judgment about what's actually happening when you put on uh, a pill. And this is one of the reasons why we created risk.org, which, uh, which is there for people to report the adverse events that are happening on pills and to give them a tool to bring to uh, 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 the doctor that may have put them on uh, the pill to help them overcome the barrier that's there, the, the sort of the awkwardness about trying to tell the doctor, look, this pill hasn't worked supremely well for me. It hasn't worked absolutely perfectly for me. The answer, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, if things go wrong, it isn't always a case of trying to take you off the pill. It may just be a case of trying to reduce the dose of the pill that you're on or maybe change you to a different pill. It's not an anti-pill message. In fact, quite the contrary. For people like you and me, when we go on a pill, and if, 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 if things go what you could call wrong, or if un, unusual things happen uh, on a pill, this is the single best way to discover new drugs still. Drugs like Viagra, for instance, this is the way they were actually discovered. People were there saying, you know, um, some things are happening to me that you didn't warn me about beforehand. This, this actually becomes a whole new drug treatment. So even for you know, at the pharmaceutical industry, this should be win-win to encourage people to report the adverse events that happen on pills. It'll make the drugs safer. It'll give the industry a better reputation because they don't have a good one just now at the moment. It'll restore interest to the job for doctors also because, you know, they, they just handing pills out and not realizing that when a person takes a pill, this is a dramatic moment uh, when all kinds of things can happen and if we just keep our eyes open we may actually find new and useful things and if we don't find new and useful things we're at least going to keep you and me much much safer. So I think these are the things that need to happen. And just lastly, um, following up on that, if um, someone say our viewers who are watching this now, if if they are prescribed the pill and they start to see um, negative side effects or things that they feel a bit uncomfortable about or, or anything like that, what, what do you think they should do about that? Well, I think w one of the key things is that you should try and take it to uh, uh, at the doctor that has put you uh, on the pill. You should let him or her know quickly. If you find your doctor isn't listening to you, if they don't listen to you when you try to report things going wrong, if they say to you that couldn't happen, then you need to consider changing doctor. Great. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. Healy. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and it was incredibly interesting. I learned a lot from that. So thank you so much for coming on. Um, yeah, so sorry, guys. I didn't really, we didn't have any questions coming through. Otherwise, I would have, have asked them. But there were some people. Um, commenting so we know you're watching um, but thank you very much to everyone who's watched and thank you very much um, Dr Healy for coming on and, and taking the time to talk to us. Thank you very much for having me Laura it's been good fun. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>